So at this time, let's look at Psalm 121. Psalm 121. Who's ready to study God's Word tonight? If you are, say amen. amen. All right, so God who helps us and keeps us is the theme of our psalm tonight. And we read these eight verses of this short little psalm tonight. The Word of God says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth even forevermore. Can we pray together? Gracious Father, tonight we thank you and we love you for your word that is so precious to us. And we pray tonight, Lord, as we come before you with open hearts, that you would open up your word to our hearts, Lord, that you would teach us tonight what you would have us learn here in this psalm, that you would grow us and strengthen us and nourish us by your word this evening, that we may serve you better, that we may love you more, that we may love each other more, that we may shine brighter for Jesus Christ in this very dark world, for those who are in the darkness, that they may see the light of Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So we're studying this little group of Psalms. 15 different psalms from Psalm 120 through Psalm 134. Now that we finish Psalm 119, we're coming into a new group, a group of psalms, 15 psalms here, which are called Psalms of Degrees, or they're also called Psalms of Ascent. And I kind of lean towards that title, Psalms of Ascent. And they have a common theme. I, I believe the reason they're called Psalms of Ascent is because they all kind of have the same theme, even though they're all a little bit different. But they picture for us a people who are making their journey to where they worship. They are ascending up towards that place of worship. And it's a little different in each psalm, whether they're just in the city of Jerusalem, making their way up to the tabernacle, making that journey, or whether there's some kind of uh, harsh troublesome difficulty that's overtaken them from, and, and, and removed them far away from their home far away from their country, maybe war, maybe they've been defeated by their enemies, maybe their enemies have carried them off into captivity, like happened in the days of Daniel, uh, and, but they're far away from home. Some of these psalms, it's, that's the case. But whatever the case, they're homesick. They're homesick, and, but not just homesick for a place. They are homesick for something much bigger than just a place, for something that they know of in that place, and that is worship that they know of in that place. That is the experience of being in the place where the Lord chooses to dwell among his people. That's what they want. Whatever the case is in each of these psalms, they love that. They miss that. So they're traveling, they're making their ascent, if you will, uh, back up to Jerusalem, back through the city and up the steps to where the tabernacle of the, of the Lord was, bringing their sacrifices in hand, ready to offer to the Lord, ready to lift up songs of worship to the Lord, ready to listen to the Word of God and learn from the Word of God. They are making their way to the house of the Lord to worship. I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen? And... These psalms seem to also have a theme for us, and it's a, it's a much bigger picture. You know, we, some of these people were far away from home, and, and, and that's our spiritual struggle that we face. This world, as long as we live, this, and yeah, we're blessed, and, and God gives us blessings, but this world is not our home, right? The song says, I'm just a passing through, right? This world is not our home. And we long for a home in heaven. We long to make our ascent. We long to make our journey to home, to, to, our, to our eternal home, to be with our Lord where we're going to gather around the throne of Jesus and worship him together with God's people throughout the endless age of, ages of eternity. And that's going to be a great day. It's going to be a wonderful time. 
And this psalm seems to get to the heart of the matter. This psalm that we're looking at tonight, 121. Don't worry about that baby. She's making beautiful noise. She is. Those are baby amens, and they're perfect. So this psalm seems to get to the heart of the matter. This psalm seems to really focus and identify what it was the people of Israel desired as they sing this psalm. And it was so, what it was that was so precious to them that had them longing to return, what it was that was so precious to them that had them longing to make that journey home and ascend up that path. Why were those, they, these people and these families so eager to get their families out and brave the elements and risk the danger of the open road and, and make these journeys every year during the feast days, every uh, time that, that they were called to come back? Why were they so willing and so ready and so joyous to do this? This psalm points to the heart of the answer to that question. As a matter of fact, uh, just hold your place here in Psalm 121, and if you would, turn over to Isaiah. It's not very far over. Turn, turn over to the book of Isaiah, and it is uh, chapter 12. We see just a scripture that, that kind of gives us a, 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 a thought as to what it was that was so special about the nation of Israel and why the people wanted to come back there and why they wanted to go back to that temple. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 6. If you're there, would you say amen? amen. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 6. And here the Bible says, Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion. Right? Zion's of Mount Zion's a name by which Israel was called the holy city of Jerusalem built on a hill. It was called Mount Zion. And so cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel, where? In the midst of thee. In your midst. God was in, that's what they longed for. That's what they wanted, that's why they wanted to make their journey. If, if you've ever studied the book of Numbers, you know that they, they have the, they number all the congregation. And you know that when they camped out in the city, you know, they would uh, camp out with, they had 12 tribes, you know, and they would have three tribes to the north of the, ta of the tabernacle. They would have three tribes to the south of the tabernacle. They would have three tribes to the west of the tabernacle and three tribes to the east of the tabernacle. But what did that do? That put the tabernacle right in the center of the people. It put the, 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 ta the tabernacle, and, and who dwelt in the tabernacle? The Lord's presence. He chose for his presence to dwell there. And the people wanted the Lord's presence to be right in the midst of them. And, and, and you know what? We should want the Lord to be in our midst today. Everything we do ought to, ought to surround that desire that we want the Lord to dwell among us in our midst. And that's what the people of Israel had there. And, and that's what they longed for. That's what they wanted to make that journey for because the Lord's presence was right there in the midst. You know, if, if I was going to travel somewhere, if I was going to go on vacation or if I was thinking about moving somewhere to spend a lot of time somewhere that I wanted to go, I honestly have to say it would not be Jerusalem. It, it, would, it would not be Jerusalem. Have you seen the pictures? <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's, it's pretty much a city in the middle of a desert. It's hot. There's rocks everywhere. It's just, it's, it, it, and they've got enemies, and they're constantly getting missiles fired in at them, you know. Uh, it's dangerous. And, and you guys know me. If I'm going to go on a trip uh, and, and do what I want to do, it's, it's going to be somewhere beautiful with nice weather, probably a lot of good Mexican restaurants all around, you know. Uh, what I'm saying, and, and I'm not knocking Israel, it's, it's, but people don't go to Israel for a luxury vacation where you're just going to relax. People don't do that. But let me ask you a question. Do people go to Israel to see the places where Jesus lived? Do people go to Israel to see the places where he walked and where he preached and where he worked miracles? Absolutely. That's what's so special about Israel. That's what's so special about Jerusalem because this is the place where God chose to dwell, not only in the temple, but in the flesh. 
in the person of Jesus Christ who walked those streets. Um, if you could, uh, again, hold your place in Psalm 121. Let's look at Zephaniah, the third chapter. Beautiful, um, beautiful passage. Kind of uh, depicts a father who loves his child. I saw Jesse there holding the baby a while ago. And uh, just, uh, he doesn't look proud when he looks at his kids. Not at all. But I think he's pretty... He loves his kids a lot, as, as most good daddies do. But that's, that's kind of what we have pictured here is our Heavenly Father holding his child, celebrating over his child. And, and this speaks to those who belong to the Lord. It says, the Lord, it speaks to God's people who belong to the Lord. It says, the Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out, it's, it's Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 15. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy, the king of Israel. This is who's done it. Even the Lord is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil anymore. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion let not thine hands be slack. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee, is mighty to save. He will save. And so... Uh, again, that's what's so special about Israel. Not just the place where sheep are fed. Not where the place, just the place where olives grew and olive trees lived for, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 years. But the place where Jesus dwelt. The place where Jesus will return one day. The place where he was and the place where he's coming again. And in this psalm, it's not just the land of Israel that the psalmist longs for, but it's the God who dwelt among the people of Israel that he desires. And this is why he opens the psalm with these words that we see at the beginning of Psalm 121. In, in verse 1, what does he say there? He says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? Now, and many people when, when reading this make the mistake. I, I hear people quoted. I've seen people uh, posted on their social media. Many people read this, they make the mistake of thinking that the psalmist is looking to these hills for his help. They read it all kind of in one phrase, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. And, and somehow, you know, they, they believe he's finding that help in those hills. And, and that's an easy mistake to make if, if you just read through it without thinking about it. And if you read through it without considering this verse in context with the other scriptures that are around it. But, but what the psalmist is really doing here, he is first making the statement. He says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. And then he pauses for a moment. And then after that, he's asking the question, from whence comes my help? Or, or where does my help come from? And it's clear just in that first verse, just in that first verse, that his help does not come from those hills. Just even in verse 1, because he lifts his eyes to the hills first, he says, I'm going to do that first, and then after he's done that, he's left asking the question, where does my help come from? Whence cometh my help? So he did not find his help that he needs in those hills. He, he was looking to those hills, but that's clear in verse 1. He didn't find his help there. That's going to be made even more clear in a minute when we look at verse 2. And so we'll look at that in a minute. But, but the question is, why does the psalmist even tell us about his lifting up his eyes to the hills? Why, why is he telling us that he's looking up to the hills? And, and if it's not where his help is coming from, why is he telling us about, why does he even bring that up to us? Well, let me share with you because I have three thoughts on it, and you can take them, and uh, you, can, you can think about them. Uh, you can pick which one you like best, or you can throw them all away and pick your own idea. But I want to tell you uh, uh, three ideas that I have that may be reasons why he says, I'm going to look to the hills. I'll, I'll lift my eyes to the hills. And then he says, my help doesn't come from them. Why does he tell us about it? First of all, remember, this is, like we said, a psalm 
of ascent. And so he may be in a situation where he's stuck far away from home. And he's thinking longingly about getting home to Jerusalem, which is built there on a hill, which has long been lovingly referred to as Mount Zion. Maybe he's longingly thinking about Mount Moriah, where the temple was built. Uh, uh, maybe, he's, maybe he's a slave in a faraway land, and, and he's thinking, if I could just get home to where these hills are, then everything would be okay. But even if this is the case, if, if he's thinking about those hills and bringing up those hills that are there in Jerusalem around the city, if, if, he's, if he's thinking that way, even if that is the case, as the psalmist longs to go home and return to these hills that hold such a precious place in his heart, he realizes these places alone are not the answer. These hills alone cannot help him. So he's left crying out after that, where does my help come from? From whence comes my help? So, so how about Mount Calvary? Is that a precious mountain to us, right? That is a precious, there, that is certainly a precious hill to us, but, but can that hill alone help us? Can that little mountain there help us? Of course not. In, in fact, that hill would mean nothing to us had it not been for Jesus Christ who went there and did what he did there. That hill would be meaningless without Christ dying on the cross in our place on that hill. And so it's not that hill itself. It is what God did there on that hill. But let me give you another possibility. Maybe he's thinking longingly about the hills, and he's, he's away from his home. Like is the psalm of some of these, the, these, there's the theme of some of these psalms. I always say things backwards. Just get used to it and just get over it. But it, as, as is the theme of some of these psalms, he's thinking longingly about the hills that are in Jerusalem. They're precious to him. He thinks if I could get back there, that will be great. But he knows the, the help is not in those hills alone. But let me give you another possibility. Why the psalmist speaks of looking to these hills first and then saying, my help's not there, it comes from the Lord. Maybe he's having such problems. Maybe things are getting so difficult in his life that he's considering the possibility of running away and hiding in the hills. I'm going to look to the hills, and maybe that's a good place I can run away and hide. That's, that's certainly a possibility as well, why he would say this. Have, have you ever thought about quitting and, and, and trying to just run away from some of the the difficulties that you have. So the psalmist may have been very briefly uh, here thinking about fleeing from his problems, escaping into the mountains. And as a matter of fact, uh, he speaks of that in Psalm 11. But even if that's the case, and why don't you look there real quick, Psalm 11, uh, verse 1. Even if that's the case, he realizes very quickly that he doesn't have to run away. He doesn't have to do that. He has a better option than running away, and that better option is to trust the Lord. And it's Psalm 11 and verse 1. You there? Okay. So the psalmist says there in Psalm 11 verse 1, In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? So uh, the psalm that we see here where he's thought about fleeing off into the mountains when he's in a time of trouble. But he says, you know what? I, I can trust the Lord. How can you say to my soul to do that? I don't need to do that. I can trust the Lord. It's better to trust the Lord. So don't even suggest that to me. And so as soon as he thinks about that, he says, no, my help's not in that mountain. My help is in the Lord. That's another possibility, okay? And then here's a third possibility. I like this one even better. Third possibility, while the psalmist speaks of these hills, before he speaks of the Lord's help, and that is maybe he's speaking of these hills like these hills themselves are problems and obstacles that stand in his way. And maybe, uh, again, uh, he is off in a far land, and to get home he would have to cross mountains and hills uh, in the process of getting home, and that's not an easy journey. But this uh, word hill, it comes from a Hebrew word that can be translated hills or mountains or a range of mountains. And just think about it the way our Lord Jesus taught it. Remember Matthew chapter 17? And the disciples were having trouble with uh, the miraculous work they were trying to do. And, and uh, Jesus said to them, Verily I say to you, If you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Jesus said that. 
The, the Word of God uh, speaks of hills and mountains. They're spoken of in the Scripture as problems and obstacles that stand in the way of the righteous. And so the psalmist may be saying here, I want to return home, but there are many hills that stand in the way, many mountains that stand in the way. And so he could be, you can pick out whichever one you think's the best explanation of this. But regardless, three possibilities here of why the psalmist speaks of these hills. But in either case, the answer is not in those hills themselves. My help is not in these, these, these hills. But we must come to learn and trust that our help can only be found in the Lord. And the psalmist is going to show us four reasons as we make our way through the rest of the psalm tonight why we should trust in the Lord for our help. Don't trust in a place. Don't trust in some comfort you have in this life, but trust in the Almighty God. And so the first reason why we should trust God is because He is the Almighty Creator. And that's what we see beginning in verse 2. He says, he says, I look to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Who did what? Who made heaven and earth. Right? And I've told you, I'm not that great of a, uh, of a person when it comes to construction. Uh, I can't hardly put up a doghouse straight, you know, or, or a birdhouse. It doesn't look too good when I'm done with it. But uh, I can do a little bit. But, but you know, the Lord has hung the earth on nothing, the Word of God tells us. And he, he put it in place, and he, he, he spoke everything into existence. He said, let there be. And he holds it all together by the word of his power. My help does not come from those hills. My help comes from the God who created those hills. My, Mount Moriah would still be a meaningless place had God not come there and promised Abraham that he would provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Mount Moriah would still be a meaningless place if God had not shown up there and consumed the sacrifice that David offered there on the altar. Mount Moriah would still be a meaningless place and any temple ever built upon it would still be meaningless unless the Lord had chosen to manifest his presence in the midst of his people in that place. Mount Calvary would be a meaningless hill if not for the fact that Jesus gave his life for us all there on that cross. This church itself would be a meaningless building if it were not for the fact that Jesus died for us and the Holy Spirit chooses to dwell within each of our hearts. But it is his presence in us and among us that makes this an important place. Furthermore, that's the first possibility we discussed, but the, considering that second possibility, no hill anywhere on this earth would be a safe enough place to hide from the presence. Remember David thought about running to the hills and hiding? No hill anywhere on this earth would be a safe enough place to hide from the troubles that are coming on this earth. No hill would be a, a sufficient enough place to survive, and no hill would be strong enough of a refuge to protect you from the troubles that are coming on this world. I was reading the book of Revelation just uh, this morning, about 2 o'clock this morning, in chapter 6, reading about as the seven seals were opened. It came to the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. It says, I looked. When he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Now, do you want to be in a mountain when it's moved out of its place? And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the commanders and the mighty men and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. They were fleeing from God's wrath in the caves and the rocks and the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? There are no hills that are safe enough to be a strong enough, to be a sufficient enough refuge 
and a, a hiding place to run and hide in from God's presence. But the God who created those hills is a safe place. He is a refuge. Psalm 46, which we studied many, many months ago, says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. No matter what happens to this entire world, God is a safe refuge we can run to. We can feel safe in his presence. Proverbs 18 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. We can feel safe in the Lord's presence. And so it's not the mountains where David could run to and be safe. It's the Lord where David could run to. And the psalmist could run to and be safe. Furthermore, considering that third possibility we discussed, considering that third possibility, that those mountains are problems that need to be moved out of his way. I'll look to the to the hills. To the, I'll look to these mountains all around me. And where's my help going to come from? There is no problem that God can't handle. There's no, there, uh, to borrow the words from a song by Scott Wesley Brown, there's no problem too big that God cannot solve it. There's no mountain too big he cannot move it. There's no storm too dark that he cannot calm it. There's no sorrow too deep that he cannot soothe it. If he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders, I know, my brother, that he will carry you. That's my God, and he can carry whatever burden, solve any problem, calm any storm, move any mountain. And so we don't have to... We, we look to the mountains, and if, and if it's a big problem, whatever the case was here. And so Zechariah chapter 4 speaks of this too in the Old Testament. Zechariah uh, had uh, tells of the job that, uh, of rebuilding the, the city of Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple, and, and Zerubbabel was involved in all that, and he had kings around him who were enemies who were trying to stop Israel after the captivity from rebuilding their city. And Zerubbabel had this big job. He didn't know how he was going to do it. He felt so insignificant in it. He didn't feel like he was the right person for the job. But the word of the Lord spoken to him by Zechariah the prophet in, in Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6 said, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts, God has the, we may not have the power to solve the problem, but our God has the power to solve the problem. And the Lord goes on to say there, who are you, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. God says in the Old Testament, I'll move that mountain for you, Zerubbabel. God is powerful enough to handle any problem we have. And the psalmist wants us to know that we can trust God to take care of us. And so whatever the scenario was, I want to know I spent a long time to get to this. Whatever the scenario was, whether he's talking about those mountains, like they're precious to him, he wants to return to them, he knows that it's not those mountains themselves, it's the God who created those mountains, the things he's done in those mountains. Whether he's talking about running to the mountains, he knows he can't find a safe place to hide, but he can hide in the Lord who created those mountains. And he knows that even if those mountains are standing in his way, he has a God powerful enough to move them and help him with whatever problem he's got. The second reason we should trust the Lord is because he is an attentive caregiver. He is a very attentive caregiver. And he says here in verse 3, he says, He will not allow your foot to be moved. Isn't that awesome? The whole world may be shaken Will the earth be removed? The mountains are cast into the depths of the sea. We will not fear. He will not allow. That's how attentive and loving the Lord is in watching over us. The God who created heaven and earth knows every detail of it, and he's in control of every detail of it, and he still holds it all together by the word of his power. And he's the same God who created your life, and he knows every detail, and he will not let one thing happen to you that he knows is not for your eternal good. And he will not allow anything to happen to you that would move you away, not one foot away from where he knows you need to be, where he wants you to be. He goes on, the psalmist goes on in verse 3. He says, He who keeps 
you will not slumber. That word keeps, it comes from shamar, the, which, which means to guard, a, a trained guard who guards over a prisoner or guards over, uh, guards over a treasure. Uh, and he says, he who keeps you will not slumber. Some of you are starting to kind of nod off right now. Okay, but he who the Lord doesn't, he says in verse 4, he says, Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. He doesn't get sleepy, and he doesn't fall asleep. You remember the guards who fell asleep when they were supposed to be watching over the tomb of Jesus, right? And uh, what happened? They just were dead asleep when the, when the angel, of course the angel scared them half to death, and they were exhausted, and they were just fell on the ground like dead men, but they weren't dead. They were just asleep. Our God doesn't do that. He doesn't fall asleep. He doesn't pass out. Do you remember the guards who fell asleep when they were supposed to be guarding the prison where Peter was sleeping? And he was supposed to be put to death the next morning, but they were asleep. And the angel came in and walked Peter out. Do you know why Peter got to walk out with an angel that night? Because the guards were asleep. Because the Lord had them go to sleep. But you know what? When the guards who work for the wrong side, start dozing off. God does not start dozing off. He never gets tired, and he never needs rest. You know, the, only, the Bible says he created the world in six days, and he rested on the seventh day. He didn't fully rest on the seventh day because his word was still holding it all together. You know, God never completely rests, but he rested from the act of more creating on the seventh day, but he didn't do that for himself because he was tired and he just needed the rest. He did that for you and me because he knew we would get tired and we would need rest. And it would be a good example for us to follow if we would rest. The Sabbath was not given us to us as a law to keep us under its control. The Sabbath was given to us as a gift to be a blessing to us so we would know every once in a while we need to stop and we need to rest and we need to take time and, re and worship God. But God gave us that not because he needed the rest. God doesn't need rest. He doesn't get tired, and he never sleeps. He never slumbers. So you don't ever have to worry that he's not paying attention. He's got his eye on you. He's watching. He's always attentive to everything we need. And the psalmist continues in verse 5. He says, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your keeper. You will always be absolutely safe in his loving arms, and there's no person. What did Jesus say in John chapter 10? My Father who gave me... He's, he's more powerful than anybody. No man is able to pluck them out of my hand. Nobody's more, more powerful than God. You will always be safe in his strong, loving arms. And there's no problem that can ever remove you from his loving, powerful arms. The third reason we should trust him is because he's an accessible comforter. We have access to him. He's so easily accessible. In verse number five, he continues. He says, the Lord is your shade at your right hand. And that's not very far, is it? He is your shade. And, and I want you to notice how close that is, how available God, the God of the universe, how available he makes himself to you. Think about him like your shadow. Wherever you go, you can look, and he's right there always, always connected to you. You can't get away from your shadow unless you, unless you run in the dark. You, you, can, you can really see, see, though, your shadow best when you're walking in the light, and that's kind of an important lesson here. But don't get the wrong interpretation from that. He's, he's more than just a shadow that you cast. Rather, he's always casting his protective shadow over you. He says in verse 6, he says, The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. That's the way he cared for the Israelites in the wilderness. How, how do you think they survived walking in the desert for 40 years? Because the Lord... His, by his very presence was a shade over their heads during the heat of the day so that they weren't overcome with the terrible heat of the desert. And his very presence was a fire above them during the night, both to lead them and to warn them, warm them so that they wouldn't be overcome by the chill of the night because it gets pretty cold in the desert too. Though they wandered in the wilderness, they never felt homeless for the Lord was their tabernacle. And while we wander through the difficult, barren wilderness of this broken world, the Lord is always nearby us, our shade at our right hand, always nearby us to lead us, to comfort us with his very presence. Fourthly, and finally tonight, fourth reason we should trust him is because he is our abiding champion. He is our abiding champion. You could listen to all this, and boy, you could make a really good 
prosperity gospel kind of message out of this. Verse number 7, the Bible says, The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. And that sounds like a really good promise. And it is a really good promise, but many people misunderstand what it means because they think about it in the wrong way. They expect it to apply to things they, they, they simply want it to apply to, thing, but, but not what it really means. You, you see, many people hear that promise, the Lord shall, not, shall, the Lord shall preserve you you from all evil and they want to think that means God won't let anything bad happen to you. God won't let anything happen to you that you don't want to happen. And that's that's kind of the way they interpret that, but that's not what that means. It, they, they think it means God won't ever let you go through any kind of a difficult experience. But that's not what God means at all by this. And the problem is people think about this promise as a temporal promise instead of one that pertains to eternal things. And understand, when the psalmist says, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil, that doesn't mean the Lord won't let you go through some things that are difficult. It means the Lord will preserve you from evil things, from sinful things, from all things that are a spiritual attack against your soul. And he makes that clear as he continues. He says in verse 7, he says, he shall preserve your soul. Your soul. And that doesn't speak of your physical body. Your physical body is going to get sick sometimes and fail and have troubles. And eventually, your physical body is going to die. I can remember the uh, preachers that came over to our house and when my mother was sick with cancer. And she was sick with cancer for 15 years. But I can remember the charismatic preachers who came in. And they commanded, they stood there and they commanded cancer to leave her body. And then they told our family that they had seen the cancer leave her body, as if they had the authority to command the cancer to leave her body, and then she died. And I'm so thankful that I wasn't a young believer, or that my father and people in our family were not young believers who had to watch that and be hurt by that and have to question our faith because of that. As we understood, some people just don't understand some of the things the Bible teaches. But this body is just a temporary home. It is a temporary home. Just a tent that we're going to live in for a little while. Well, it's called a tabernacle. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and chapter 5, it talks about how if this tent is destroyed. We have a building of God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You don't get to keep your physical life forever, but be assured of this, God shall preserve your eternal soul. He shall preserve your soul. He's going to let you keep that forever. And so one of these days they're going to announce that Brother Chris has died. He ate one too many bacon cheeseburgers and his little heart couldn't take it anymore and just gave up. And they're going to say, he's dead. And don't you believe it, not for a minute, because I will be alive in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. The psalmist goes on to conclude. He says, the Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. This is an eternal promise. This is an eternal... You can't trust this world. You can't trust anything in this world, but you can trust the one who created it. The one who created you, because he's promised to take perfect care of your eternal soul forever. That's why Paul exclaims in the book of Romans in chapter 8, I am persuaded... That neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other crea creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. So if my body gives out, my spirit is forever with the Lord. And I'm going to live forever with Him. And I'm going to rejoice forever with Him. 
and He preserves my soul. And so our help doesn't come from those hills, it comes from the God of those hills, right? And boy, he's, we, we see tonight that He's a wonderful, wonderful helper and keeper. Amen? What did Jesus say? If I go away, I will send the helper. If I don't go, I can't send Him, but I'll send Him to you. And our God is a helper and He's a keeper. And the fact that the helper is present in our lives is just the earnest of our eternal expectation. He's the earnest of that. That means we can know because the Spirit is in our lives that we're going to be in that eternal place with Almighty God. He's going to finish what He started in us. So be thankful tonight. Be thankful.